now watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Davenport Auto Park, the ride of your life. And also sponsored by Flora's Glass, serving the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work. folks and welcome to another episode of Way Back Wednesday. I'm your host Randy Adcock. So glad you could be with us tonight. Uh, before we get started, I want to say a special thanks to Brittany Austin who's in the control room tonight. Um, Lee, our regular control room, took a little on the weather tonight and so he couldn't make it but Brittany has graciously agreed to come in and run the control room for us. So um, we're in good hands with Brittany. She's worked with us before on the show and so glad to have her here. And um, Lee, if you're watching, I hope you're feeling better soon and um, hope you all got a quick mend there. Okay, you know, last week's show, we uh, spent a fair amount of time talking about um, uh, plane crash victims, and in particular, uh, the story about Janice Gravely is one that, I don't know about you, but it really kind of stuck in my mind. Um, I had remembered that, that that accident happened, the crash happened, and that she had survived, and her husband, unfortunately, did not. But um, I was not, um, I couldn't remember a lot of details. And so, if you remember from last week's show also, uh, Lee actually found one of Janice's books here in the studio and brought it to me and um, so we shared a little bit of that last week and so uh, I took the book home with me for two reasons number one there were some pictures in there and I'm going to share some of those with you tonight but more importantly I wanted to read the book I, I, I just I knew it was going to be a fascinating read and I wanted to read it and I'm sorry to say I have not had a chance to read the entire book I've kind of read through certain chapters and certain passages um, over the last several days but I've not finished reading the entire book. Um, but it is a fascinating story. I mean, in, any adjective you want to use, uh, amazing, miraculous, incredible, um, and, and Janice too. I mean, the, the uh, ac accolade that could be uh, put with her name, um, you know, in, incredible, heroic, um, brave, uh, certainly determined. Um, I mean, she, the fact that she survived is all, at all is an absolute miracle, but uh, what she went through and, um, and what she did, uh, the will to survive was just very evident in everything she did that fateful day in January of 1982. But um, as I said, there were some neat pictures in that book, uh, and I didn't get them all because a lot of them were family pictures, but I did choose a few to share with you tonight. And so we're going to share some pictures uh, from, from Janice's book. I'm going to share with you a little bit about both Janice and Edmund, uh, their early days, childhood, and so forth. Um, and I want to uh, want to send a couple of shout outs tonight and thanks, uh, number one, to uh, Randy Harrell. Randy's a regular watcher of the show. He's an old boy from Rocky Mountain, now living out in Tennessee. And, um, but uh, he had uh, sent me some pictures, and we'll share those with you later on who may be a, a distant relative of his. We're not sure about that, but if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the many uh, Rocky Mount Telegram uh, photographers over the years, and certainly everyone's familiar with Bugs Berenger and Charlie Killebrew, but there were a multitude of others, and over the last few months, we've seen pictures from Larry Tucker, for example, 
and um, oh gee, a couple more. But anyway, Alfred Harrell is is one that um, I had not known about until very recently. And so Randy Harrell actually, and we're still trying to determine if he's related. He's going to do some more digging. He said, but uh, he sent some pictures tonight, so we'll get to those in a little bit too. And lastly, um, you know. For those that are familiar with the Stony Creek Rescue Squad here in Rocky Mount, um, golly, as far back as I can remember, probably a good 60 or 70 years, uh, they provided a very worthwhile service here in Rocky Mount, uh, transporting accident victims and people who were having uh, emergencies, uh, whether it be a heart attack or stroke. Um, but uh, sadly, they, they are no more. Stony Creek Rescue Squad closed its doors for the last time a week or so ago. And so um, we're going to try to get the, the last chief on the show uh, sometime here in the next few weeks. And um, we'll try to get a little history about Stony Creek, how it got started, how long it was an operation in, in its entirety. And um, so looking forward to getting the chief on and talking with him and kind of getting a little information, a little history about Stony Creek Rescue Squad. With all that being said, you know, um, getting back to Janice Gravely, as I said, her story uh, is certainly incredible. Uh, it's amazing uh, that she was able to, to fly that airplane literally for two hours with no experience, no, no flight training uh, whatsoever. And you know, you, you hear about stories and you read stories about people who were in similar situations and they had someone fly a similar plane up beside them and then you know, walk them through how to land a plane. And that, um, that option just never uh, happened for Janice. It just it wasn't in the work, so to speak. Um, she was unfamiliar with the radio control of the airplane and, and didn't know that she was even being monitored, didn't know if anyone was even hearing her message. She was calling out on the radio for help. And so uh, they didn't know where she was. Um, the flight took off from uh, Rocky Mount, uh, headed to Georgia on a cold January morning in 1982. And um, as they crossed over between North Carolina and South Carolina uh, state lines, uh, her husband just slumped over in the pilot seat over there. And she's she remarks in the book that she first thought he was looking for something on the floor. And she asked him what he was looking for, and he didn't respond. And so she asked him again, and he didn't respond, and she realized something was wrong. And at that point, um, that was her last you know, uh, pilot, if you will. Um, it, from that point on, she was on her own, literally. And so um, the book has got a lot of information about what happened during that flight. But I did a little bit of information about uh, Janice and her husband Edmund both. And so I want to kind of share some, some history about the two of them with you tonight. And um, Brittany, if you would, let's go ahead and start off with the first picture. This was from the book. This is Janice at about age five. And um, she was actually a West Coast girl, um, born up around Oregon, um, northwestern part of the country over there. Um, and oddly enough, uh, Edmund, her husband, was an East Coast fella um, from around the uh, Virginia area. Richmond, Virginia was where he was from. And so it's kind of unusual that they got together at all, but they did. And, um, you know, had by all accounts had a storybook marriage and, um, you know, wonderful kids and just, uh, you know, very active in the community, both of them. Um, Janice um, was a graduate of UCLA. Um, in fact, the picture number two there, if you would, Brittany, is, is her, one of her pictures from college. Um, she was on the mortar board. Uh, she was the president of her senior class. Um, oh, golly, she had a whole lot of accolades there. Um, the Religious Conference Student Board, Alpha Chi Alpha, Student War Board Committee. Uh, chairman of University Camp Drive. By the way, keep in mind now, she was born in 1921. So she was in college during World War II, and so she was very active in the war effort uh, as a college student. And then as she graduated college, uh, she knew she wanted to do something to help the war effort, so she joined the Navy. And um, because of her you know, college background, she uh, joined the Navy as, as an ensign, uh, an officer in the Navy. And that's how she ended up meeting Edmund, uh, her future husband, because he was also in the Navy. Um, he was a, a naval aviator and actually trained pilots in World War II. Um, I didn't find anywhere where he actually served in combat. Now, that, I'm not saying he did not. I just have not run across anything that suggested that he was actually in combat or flew any combat missions. But he certainly uh, trained uh, Navy uh, pilots 
uh, many of whom did engage in, in you know, conflicts all around the world during World War II. So they both play their part, I guess is what I'm trying to say, in, in, in supporting the war effort. Um, as a young fellow, and we'll go back and forth here between the early times and, and later times, picture number four, uh, I'm sorry, number three. We got three yet, Brittany? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Um, this is Edmund at approximately age six, it said, and uh, already a good looking young fellow there. And as I said, he actually grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, his family was in the tobacco business there. Uh, they, his grandfather actually started the China American Tobacco Company. And uh, of course, when he opened up here in, in Rocky Mount, it was an immediate success. This being a, you know, a, a hub, if you will, of tobacco, uh, not only farming but certainly uh, marketing. Um, with the trains here, uh, you know, tobacco was shipped out all over the tobacco was shipped all over the country, and so uh, you know, tobacco business was a big business, uh, and certainly for many, many years. But at the time that um, he got out of the Navy. He came back here and went to work in the family business. And so, um, before I go too much further, I want to show you a picture of him. Picture number four, uh, Brittany, if you would. This is actually, um, well, this is her. And, you know, she was a beautiful young woman, obviously. Um, I was a little thrown by the lapel pin up there. It almost looks like an airplane, but I, I you know, I did not see that she herself was a pilot. I didn't see where she had any pilot training. Um, she was actually, um, she was uh, commissioned into the what was then called the WAVE, the Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. Now, I know there were some, some women who volunteered to shuttle airplanes around, for example, and fly planes around from one base to another. So it is entirely possible that she may have flew some but nothing that I have seen in anything I've read about her suggests that she had any formal flight training. So I'm not sure what that lapel pin was, but in any case, she was active duty, um, and that's how they met. And so in 1944, they, um, they decided to, to get together and, and get married. And go ahead, uh, Britton, if you would, let's put up the next picture here then. And this is her. Uh, as an incident, this picture says U.S. Naval Reserves um, in the Naval Air Station, Dallas, Texas. And that's where they that's where they actually met at. And um, if you notice, it's kind of hard to see, but up there, that blackboard above her head, she was actually, and this is kind of unusual to, for because she was a junior officer, obviously an ensign is a very junior officer in in the military ranks in the Navy, but she was the OOD or officer of the day. So she had a little bit of clout. Uh, for such a junior officer. I'm not sure what she was doing, what position she had at that base, um, but whatever it was, she was officer of the day. And so, like I said, he and her both ended up at Dallas. Um, they met through some means, probably mutual friends, who knows, but in any case, they started dating. And in 1944, May of 1944, they got married. Um, had a really nice church wedding, um, very nice ceremony. And this is their um, engagement slash wedding picture here. And a um, sharp looking couple there. You see Ensign um, Janice Bevon was her maiden name. And um, Lieutenant um, uh, J.G. Edmund King Gravely uh, were married in Dallas. And uh, like I said, it goes on to say that uh, she was actually living in Los Angeles, um, obviously going to UCLA. So. Uh, I think her family had it ended up in Los Angeles too, in fact, even though she was born up in uh, Oregon, from what I read. But in any case, uh, they got married April 1944, I'm sorry, May of 1944. And the next picture, if you would, Brittany, go ahead and let's bring that up too, because this is another picture of the actual ceremony. Um, you see all the full dress whites there. Um, and Chaplain, it looks like uh, Ketter Henrik. Uh, pronounces man and wife till death do us part. Uh, Love Field, Dallas, Texas. And um, uh, Edmund's father, uh, Winston, was his uh, son's best man. Again, May the 7th, 1944 is when they got married. Um, they came back to Rocky Mount. There you go. There's a, that's another picture. We'll get to that one shortly. They came back to Rocky Mount and they lived, actually moved into a house at 540 Falls Road. And for those that are familiar with Falls Road, that, um, there's some really nice houses along there. Um, in fact, go ahead, uh, Brittany, I almost called you Lee again. <laughs> go ahead and put that next picture up. 
I pulled this picture here off of Google Maps, and this house right in the center here is 540 Falls Road. And of course, this is a, a modern picture. Um, that house to the right, uh, I believe, is Dr. Battle's house, I'm not mistaken, uh, just to, off the screen to your right there. But anyway, this is a couple of blocks um, from, say, the public library down there. If you were be headed uh, toward the hot dog stand, and that part would be on your left there if you're leaving the library, headed toward the hot dog stand. But anyway, this is where they were living, and uh, they raised their, their kids here, and this is where they were living, in fact, when uh, when the tragic uh, crash occurred and, and he was killed. But, um, you know, this, by today's standards, that's not a particular fancy house. I mean, it, I would have thought it would have been a, I'm sure it was at the time it was very elegant on the inside, very nice. Um, but of the houses that were in that area, it was certainly not one of the bigger ones. But, you know, in any case, I'm sure it was very nice on the inside. Um, they, um, they lived there, and I'm not sure, at, at some point I think she moved after he died, and I've not been able to determine where they moved or where she moved to after he passed away. But um, in any case, she actually um, outlived him, obviously. Um, she went on, she was born in May of 1921, and she lived until December 15th of 2020. And I want to read you a little bit here about uh, her. This is from her obituary. Um, like I said, she died December 15, 2020, uh, just a few months shy of her 100th birthday. Had she lived for the following May, she'd have been 100 years old. Um, said, uh, born May the 9th, 1921 in Spokane, Washington. I think I said Oregon earlier. She was born in Spokane, Washington, excuse me. The daughter of Lottie Jane Brown and David Edwin Beaven. She was preceded in death by her husband, uh, her brother, and so forth. Um, Raised in Los Angeles, California, Janice grew up during the Great Depression, her family at times sharing their home with other families in distress. She graduated from the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. She was valedictorian and president of her graduating class, and she graduated with honors. She was also president of her sorority, Tri Delta, and a member of Mortar Board, a national honor society. During her junior year at UCLA, after Pearl Harbor, she was determined to serve after graduation when she was commissioned into the Navy Waves, and again, that's the women accepted for volunteer emergency service. She asked for duty station on either coast and was assigned to the Naval uh, Station in Olathe, Kansas, where she met Lieutenant Junior Grade Ed Gravely as an aviator. Um, it was a little... I, I, I saw that line there, but I also saw where they, somewhere else, another article said they met in Dallas. So there's a little bit of discrepancy there. Uh, they may have met in Kansas, but I did see another article that suggested they met in Dallas, and that's where they were eventually married for sure. It said after the war, Janison had been moved to Rocky Mount, where he joined the family business, the China American Tobacco Company, which had been founded by his grandfather. Um, Transitioning from California to North Carolina, Janice knit into her life, uh, knit her life into the extended Gravely family in Rocky Mount and into Southern life. She was a member of the Junior Guild of Rocky Mount, served on the Rocky Mount Public School Board of Education. She taught for a time at R.M. Wilson Junior High School and was a Girl Scout troop leader. She was an active member of the Daughters of the American Revolution and Colonial Time, uh, Dames, excuse me. In her 30s, she became an avid painter. Using all media, watercolors, pastels, charcoal, and oils, she continued until earlier this year. Now, this article was written uh, back in, uh, well, 2020 when she passed away, obviously. So, anyway, uh, it says, uh, let's see, she traveled extensively with trips to Europe, Israel, Russia, as well as summers in Roaring Gap, North Carolina. Her work was featured at the Dunn Center. Um, in 2011, her flags on Falls Road uh, from the uh, memorial to the meal, one day's under God, was an exhibit at the Imperial Arts Center, and her self-portrait was hung at the North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh. Uh, let's see here. I'll tell you what, before I go any further, I just realized it's time for our first commercial break, so let's do that. Let's go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll share a little bit more about her and, and Edmund, and then I've got some other things to share with you, some other pictures, and uh, we'll get into all that when we come back after this break. Don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back.
I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitation and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here at Cornerstone Funeral Home. When faced with special care needs for elderly or disabled loved ones, families want compassionate, comforting care. That's Tender Touch Home Care Services' goal, providing the level of care we would expect for our own. With over 10 years of home care excellence, Tender Touch provides an array of services that keeps your loved one at home. From personal care, light housekeeping, errands, and meal preparation, to our private duty care program, which combines all of our home care offerings in one package. Tender Touch Home Care Services, where your needs are our concern. And we're back. We're back. Folks, you're just tuning in. You're watching Way Back Wednesday. I'm Randy Adcock. So glad you could be with us tonight. Uh, during the break, I got a call from Bob Merritt. Bob's tuning in with us tonight, and he was telling me that um, the little lapel pins that we showed earlier on Janice's um, Navy uniform were actually anchors. So <laughs> um, I'm about to shame to say I'm an ex-sailor myself and didn't catch that. But in any case, that's what they are. Uh, I think they changed the look over the years. They were different when I was in. But in any case... Uh, that's what they were. They said they weren't anything to do with aviation. They were just anchors. Um, read a little bit here more from her obituary in, in uh, 2020. It says, uh, Janice worked with area ministers to hold noon prayer at City Hall on the National Day of Prayer and conceived a way for churches and individuals to read aloud the entire Bible in a single day to declare the importance of the Bible in our nation's life. You know, of all the things that have been said about Janice uh, Gravely, uh, one of the things that's a recurring theme is her, uh, her sincere devotion and commitment. Um, she was a very religious person, and her faith, um, without a doubt, enabled her to survive. Um, and she makes mention of her faith many times throughout her book and uh, in her speeches. And she, when, she talks about, when she talked about uh, her ordeal and, and went around the country talking to people about what she had been through, she was always very forefront with her faith and how important it was to her and, and how she was absolutely certain that it was her faith that allowed her to survive that ordeal and to come through it. Um, and by the way, she, you know, she landed that, crash landed that plane, um, and unfortunately her husband did not survive, but she didn't come away unscathed either. She had a broken pelvis, she had three or four fractured ribs, um, she had cuts and bruises all over her. Um, she was banged up pretty good. In fact, I read a, a short segment today in the book that said um, while she was in the hospital in Henderson, well, that's where the plane crashed, well, outside of Henderson in Vance County, um, they were going to admit her. She said, no, I want to go to Rocky Mountain. That's where I'm from. I, you know, I don't want my friends and family to drive all the way up here an hour or so away to come visit me. I want to be in Rocky Mountain. And so the hospital said, well, we can't release you unless you sign a waiver stating that we're not liable if something happens to you on the way between here and there. And so she did. She signed a waiver to allow them to transport her from the hospital at Henderson back to National here in Rocky Mount so she could be here closer to her family and her friends. And, and so um, to be as banged up as she was, that was, that was quite a, a, a leap of faith, if you will, in itself to, to trust that she'd be okay um, making that journey. And I'm sure they you know, sped along as quickly as was, as was possible. But still, you know, Henderson's about an hour away, so even at the speed of an ambulance uh, with the lights and sirens blaring and everything else, it's probably still a good 40-minute drive. But uh, she came back here, and so anyway, um, but she, you know, is a remarkable lady, and, you know, it's, it's just 
is the kind of person that you, if you didn't know her, you wish you did. And, and those that I have spoken with who did know her said she was just as, you know, a, a superb person. And um, I just, I hate that I never got an opportunity to meet her myself, frankly. I want to read a little bit about uh, from Edmund, uh, from Ed's uh, obituary. And it said, Ed, this was when he died in uh, January of 1982. This was the bitch would appear in the Rocky Mountain Telegram. And by the way, another interesting thing about this story, uh, the plane crash and his death and her survival, this story literally made it around the globe. I mean, this, this story uh, appeared uh, certainly all over the United States. It appeared in Germany and France and Australia. Um, it was a global story, not, you know, the fact that she survived, the fact that, um, you know, it was, it was so many things against her surviving, I guess is the best way to say that. The odds were against her and stacked so, so far against her that the fact that she did survive uh, really it was a instrumental in, in helping people all over the world, you know, and, and the story was one that was relatable by people all over the world. Okay, Graveside, uh, no, I'm sorry. Gravely was also president of Chesapeake Storage Company in Richmond, Virginia. He was the president of Virginia Cosette uh, incorporated in Williamsburg. He was the chairman of the board of directors of Wachovia Bank in Rocky Mount. He was chairman of the executive committee of the Leaf Tobacco Exporters Association. He was the chairman of the board of Gravely Fund of First United Methodist Church in Rocky Mount. He was a member of the Kiwanis Club, Benvenue Country Club, the Roaring Gap Country Club, the Commonwealth Club of Richmond, Virginia, a Navy flight instructor in World War II. He had earned the Diamond Award for the American Soaring Society. So, obviously, uh, and all of this, you know, was at the time of his death, uh, obviously, everything except the war, uh, pilot trainer in World War II, but uh, they were both very active in the community, and you know, certainly um, his death was a shock to not only Rocky Mount, but uh, business and industry leaders all over the country who had met him in, in one fashion or another. Um, Sad outcome to that story, but at the same time, it's a remarkable story in that she was able to survive and tell that story. So, okay, I mentioned earlier about um, Randy Harrell sending me some pictures. Um, when, oh, I almost forgot. There's a couple more. I wanted to show you these. These are pictures of the airplane. So go ahead, Brittany, if you would. There's three pictures. Actually, there's a couple more, too, I want to get to. I almost forgot about these. There, when she crashed that plane, she literally crawled between 250 and 300 feet. Uh, she had a broken hip. She had to crawl to get to a house. Uh, it was a double wide mobile home. And she went to the front door, crawling on her, on her hands and knees. And she couldn't get in the house because she couldn't get up the steps. She called out. It was a blustery day. The wind was blowing. She couldn't get anybody to the door. She didn't know whether there was anybody in the home. She literally crawled on her hands and knees all the way around this home to the back and found a very similar set of steps and stoop at the back that she just could not make it up. And so she looked around the yard and she found a couple of rocks in the yard and she picked up a rock and threw it at the, at the door. And when it didn't open, she picked another rock up and threw it again. I think on the third rock, somebody finally came to the back door and opened the door and saw her laying out there. And um, so they you know, brought her in the house and then called for the rescue squad and so forth. But um, anyway, that was the home, that, that trailer you just saw there was the home of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Craig and Lovey Jones. There they are. There's Craig and Lovey Jones and Janice in the middle. Um, I've only ever heard of one other person with the name Lovey, and that was my great-grandmother, oddly enough. I had a great-grandmother named Lovey. But uh, these, this, was in, uh, this picture was taken after Janice. And you can see here now, this plane crash happened uh, January uh, the 10th, I think it was, of 82. And literally less than a month later, she was up on her feet and had gone to visit these people. Um, and that's them. They're the ones that uh, she, when she finally got somebody to the door, they, they kind of looked out for her. But anyway, the plane, of course, was totally destroyed. And it was a relatively new Mooney 20. Um, he had only had this plane about three months, I understand, uh, but in any case, it was totally destroyed. As you can see there in the picture, uh, one wing was almost completely torn off. There's a little bit of a stub there on the left-hand side, uh, but the majority of that wing was gone. You see the right wing is all banged up, too. Um, the cabin itself was pretty well banged up. Um, the rear stabilizers tore all up. Uh, it, it's, it's a little it's a miracle that anyone survived this plane crash at all. Um, but in any case, that, um, I think that's, oh, there's one more picture. The News and Observer had a picture 
um, right there. And that was the only other picture I saw of the actual plane crash itself. But um, that was that picture there appeared in the News Observer. And I think we've also got one more picture of Edmund himself. Um, right there you go, 1982. And then lastly, we've got a picture of Janice from the back of her book. And this would have appeared in 1990 when that book came out. And this picture here actually is, appears on the back, of the back cover of the book. Uh, you know, she actually wrote another book too, um, in addition to this one, which was, um, I think it was called Won't Somebody Please Help Me. Um, there was another book she wrote that basically just kind of categorized her faith and it's a story of, of how, how, how important her faith is to her. There you go. Alrighty, so I mentioned Randy Harrell had sent me these pictures of Alfred Harrell and so without further ado, let's go ahead, uh, Brittany, if we could, and let's jump into these. Um, this is Mr. Alfred, Alfred Harrell in 1924. Uh, he was about, I don't know, two or three years old in this picture. Um, I'm not exactly sure where he was born or where this picture was taken at, but you know, it's really unusual to have a picture of, you know, back in the 1920s, photography was still, you know, it's kind of in its infancy. And to have a picture of, you know, that clarity and equality from that far, that's over a hundred year old picture, obviously. But um, we'll go ahead, let's go ahead to the next one too, Brittany, because there's a couple more here I want to kind of get to. Um, in 1944, um, well, this says he enlisted in 42, discharged in 45, but this is a picture of, of Alfred uh, Harrell in his, in his uniform, and he came to Rocky Mount, um, oh golly, I, I read somewhere what year he came to Rocky Mount, but he was here in some of the same time frames as Charlie Killebrew. In fact, they were, they were friends, I understand, and so there's a picture, um, let's go ahead, um, and go to the next one because I think there's a picture here of them. Okay, there you go. This is actually his marriage wedding here, I should say. Um, he married um, Carolyn Lucille Wilson uh, in 1944, I think it was, and this is their wedding picture right here. And um, so anyway, in the next picture, if we could, there you go. That's a picture of him, uh, Alfred Franklin Harold Jr., and his wife, Carolyn Lucille uh, Wilson. And there's their birth dates and death dates and times. And let's go ahead too to the next one if we could. And there you go. This picture right here, that's, uh, that's Alfred Harrell on the right hand side. The picture on the left is the same fellow, top and bottom picture. Um, I was going to play a little game of who can guess who this is, but I, I, I kind of give it away already. That's a very young Charlie Killebrew on the left hand side of the screen there in both the upper and lower picture, Charlie Killebrew. And I would not have known that had Randy not pointed out to me. When Randy Harrell sent me these pictures, uh, he said, in case you didn't realize it, that's Charlie Killebrew on the left. And I said, yep, it sure is. I looked at it closer then, I realized that's Charlie. Um, and so, you know, they were obviously acquaintances, um, both in the field of photography, uh, probably worked together on some jobs too, I would imagine, uh, as was common back then. Um, you know, Charlie Killebrew's career with the Telegram spanned several decades. Um, so did, uh, so did uh, Franklin Harrell, uh, Alfred Harrell's too for that matter. They both, you know, covered a lot of events uh, in and around Rocky Mountain, Eastern North Carolina. Um, certainly there are a multitude of photographs in the Rocky Mountain Telegram over the years that, that both these gentlemen took. Um, I'm hoping somebody somewhere has got an archive of uh, Alfred Harrell's photographs. I've not found anything yet. I will continue to dig into that and look and see. Um, if you remember from past shows, there's a really great collection of Charlie's pictures, of course, at Chapel Hill at the Wilson Library up there. And, um, and they're, they're really superb quality pictures, um, much better than, than these that we've been showing recently that have been basically um, extracted from a newspaper clipping or an article. And so, um, but I have no idea how many pictures Alfred Harrell took, but certainly I'm seeing more pictures than I, than I ever knew existed that he had taken. So I'm hoping somebody somewhere has got a, a, a collection of his photographs, and if I ever get my hands on or find them, I'll share those with you as well. Okay, let's see here. So let's go ahead, Brittany, to the next one. Um, and let's see, this may be, okay, this was an ad that appeared. This is not Alfred Harrell, obviously. But this is an ad that appeared in 1951, um, and this was from Harold's studio, Alfred Harold's studio. 
Notice it says next to Belt Tyler's. And so I'm not sure how long the studio was there or when it ceased to be in operation there. Um, but in any case, uh, apparently at some time, and you know, if you think about it, that was a great place to have a, a photography studio because folks, you know, coming in and out of Bells on a regular basis. You gotta remember this was well before any kind of mall uh, hit Rocky Mount. And so downtown Rocky Mount was the place to shop, not only for Rocky Mount, but a good portion of Eastern North Carolina came to Rocky Mount to shop. And Belks was certainly one of the um, leading stores uh, in the area. And so if you had a photography shop or photo shop right beside of Belks, um, that's, I mean, that's great for business. And people coming in and out of Belks all the time and certainly a special events, graduation as this ad implies here. Um, it was just, you know, people buying new clothes and, and wanting to get a, a memorial photograph, so to speak. Great location there for a photographer. Okay, so let's see. I lost track. Brittany, where we are? 22. 22? <laughs> okay. This is another neat thing that Randy sent me. This is actually from 1922. And you see the heading at the top. It says Rocky Mount Public Library Association. And... Of course, now we all know it as the uh, Brazel Memorial Library uh, because in later years it was renamed in honor of uh, Mr. Brazel's son. But prior to it being named Brazel Library, it was just called Rocky Mount Public Library. And this is a listing of the Board of Trustees and there's some very prominent names on this list. You see on the bottom down there, there's Thomas Battle was president. Uh, Mrs. J.R. Bennett was uh, vice president. Uh, Norman Chambliss was the secretary. Um, Mrs., uh, oh boy, that's another, I guess it's Miss Thomas Battle, um, uh, with librarian, I guess that is. Um, Brittany, can you zoom in on that bottom? of some other names down there that I recognize when I was reading over it earlier. Uh, it may not, it may not zoom. If it don't, it's okay. But a lot of these were very prominent people in Rocky Mount and went on to become very prominent business people. Uh, leaders and you know community leaders business leaders uh, but there's some very prominent names there are some doctors on here um, some attorneys I think uh, but certainly a lot of business people so Rocky Mount Public Library had a really good um, foundation if you will of people with financial backing that could put into a library and, and get it off the ground and so it's good that it came together but uh, it would not have done possible to do that without these input me people who uh, put forth their time and effort and some money, I'm sure, to get it going. I'll tell you what, just about now is a good time as in to take our next commercial break. Uh, when we come back from the break, we're going to show you some more pictures. We'll take your phone calls, by the way, 407-1111 is your number. Uh, if you got anything you want to share with us, any memories, feel free to give us a call. Uh, but for now, pay attention to these messages from our sponsors, folks, and we'll be right back with more Way Back Wednesday. I'm Daniel Moss, owner of Cornerstone Funeral Home, and I'd like to invite you and your family to give our family an opportunity to serve you in your time of need. And we offer a full line of funeral services, everything from visitations to graveside services to cremations on site with a live crematory, as well as a banquet hall to meet the catering needs of our families that we serve. We offer catering service, we offer refreshments prior to visitation and services of our family, and we want to invite you to come and experience the difference here. Cornerstone Funeral Home. When faced with special care needs for elderly or disabled loved ones, families want compassionate, comforting care. That's Tender Touch Home Care Services' goal, providing the level of care we would expect for our own. With over 10 years of home care excellence, Tender Touch provides an array of services that keeps your loved one at home. From personal care, light housekeeping, errands, and meal preparation, to our private duty care program, which combines all of our home care offerings in one package. Tender Touch Home Care Services, where your needs are our concern.
back. We're back. Folks, you're watching Way Back Wednesday. I'm Randy Adcox. Good to have you with us tonight. Um, we were talking before the break about um, some uh, photographs and pictures that uh, Randy Harrell had sent me of Alfred Harrell and um, public library stuff and so forth. Um, I thought it would be neat tonight to just kind of go back and look at some old ads and, and, and talk a little bit about those. Um, and we're going to get to also a minute um, some neat ads about uh, party line telephone calls. Um, some of you remember those, I'm sure. Uh, I certainly do. Uh, a lot of younger people may not remember or know anything about a party line telephone, but uh, they were certainly very popular at one time in this country, and, and it was amazing. Um, I heard a story of the day, someone told a story about, um, uh, it was apparently this young couple who uh, spent a lot of time on the phone talking to each other, um, but not saying anything. They <laughs> And some of the people on the party line would pick up the phone and just hear the one or the other breathing heavily of the telephone and very little conversation taking place. And this went on for some time. And, and then apparently after, I don't know, several weeks or a month or so, uh, the young girl turned up pregnant. And so the gossip throughout the neighborhood was that she must have got pregnant over the telephone because I never saw them together and never saw those two people together in any way, but I always heard them on the phone uh, breathing heavy to each other over the telephone over the party line. So anyway, um, let's go ahead, if we could, let's jump into that next picture. In 1963, Montgomery Wards joined the Terrytown Mall. And, you know, many of you remember Montgomery Wards. I certainly do. Uh, or Monkey Wards, as we used to call it. Um, it was a neat place to shop. You know, it's kind of, in a lot of ways, Montgomery Wards reminded me of Sears. You know, they had the clothing line. They had the appliance line. They had hardware, I mean, home electronics. Um, they had the automotive section in the back where you get your tires rotated or get new tires put on. Uh, so you get your oil change, your battery. I mean, uh, Montgomery Wars was just a, kind of a one-stop shop. And I think in many ways it rivaled Sears. Um, I, I think it's safe to say they were certainly competitors. And, you know, when uh, Terrytown was flooded by um, Hurricane Floyd, in 1999, it's a shame that Montgomery Ward was one of the stores that just couldn't couldn't make it back. Um, sadly, you know, Sears suffered um, in other ways. They weren't at, at the mall then, of course, and didn't get flooded. But um, over the years, arguably two of the most prominent department stores that have ever occupied a street on Rocky Mount are both out of business uh, for different reasons, but still. Uh, Montgomery Wards was a place that I used to shop at myself. My mother worked there for a while, in fact, um, and I had some friends who worked there. Um, it was a neat store. I enjoyed shopping at, at Terrytown Mall in general and certainly enjoyed going in Montgomery Wards. Uh, but July of 1963 is when Montgomery Wards joined Terrytown Mall. Okay, the next picture was one that I had to stop and scratch my head about. I mean, this is an advertisement that appeared. Um, and this, this ad appeared in 1990, so it's not terribly old. And it's actually a, an ad that um, was talking about sewing machines. Apparently, a sewing school ordered a bunch of machines, and sewing machines that didn't sell them all. So there was a big blowout sale, and this guy was actually set up at the Holiday Inn at Dorch's selling um, highly discounted sewing machines. Um, you know, this kind of this kind of thing used to be pretty prevalent, actually, and I always suspected that whatever it was they were selling, whether it be sewing machines or uh, hi-fi stereo equipment or whatever, uh, was, you know, acquired by some kind of uh, underhanded means or, or illegal means. And I don't, I'm not saying that's what this was here, but um, you used to see it quite often. He would pull up a, on a side of a road with a big truck and, you know, kind of flag post down, hey, I got a bunch of leftover inventory here from a place that went out of business or we got some overstock here, got to get rid of. But, um, I couldn't remember at first where the Holiday Inn was at Deutsches. And after thinking about it, I said, okay, I now know where it was. It's, the building's been long torn down now. But uh, if you come off, uh, if you come over I-95 Bridge from Rocky Mount, uh, just leaving Deutsches headed toward Red Oak, it was right on the right-hand side, of course. And, um, you know, I, it's kind of surprising that the hotel didn't make it right there. But for whatever reason, it didn't. And so. It's been gone now for some time, but when I saw that ad, I had to stop and scratch my head. Where was the Holiday Inn at Dorsey's? Okay, let's go ahead and bring this to the next one if we could. 
And this is actually, um, this appeared uh, in December of 1957. And I'll just read this to you. It says, if Elvis Presley wants a deferment from his draft board, then Elvis himself is going to have to ask for it. The board received a request yesterday from Paramount Studios requesting a two-month deferment for the rock and roll singer. But a spokesman for Shelby County Draft Board said selective service regulations call for a written request from the registrant himself. Oh, let's get this call here. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Hello, caller. Hey. Yes, sir. You're on the cage tonight. Yes, sir. We're on the air. What can I do for you? Um, yeah, I, I was uh, going to say me and my me and my wife for 27 years. We we had our uh, uh, our reception at that hotel. At the Holiday Inn and Dorches. Uh, Holiday Inn and Dorches. Yes, okay. Sir. Yeah. They, they they put a big old sign out there. You know, happy. Uh, Happy wedding day and everything, and I thought I mean it was kind of a out of the way place, you know. It, it was. I mean, you had to go down a long drive to get down there. That's right. And uh, but uh, you know they they had a good thing going then. I, I always wondered what why they uh, tore it down. They had a nice pool out there, but. Uh, uh, and I think you could pay to go swimming out there in the summertime. Yeah, yeah they had a had a restaurant out there, had a bar out there. Um, You're right, and yeah. uh, it was a nice place. And, it uh, was nice. You know, but me and my wife had our uh, reception dinner out there, and we were probably probably one of the last ones, maybe to have a uh, a thing uh, going out there. But what what year was that? Anyway, I. I, I you know, I, I often wondered why in the world, you know, they tore that place down. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing to me, too, uh, because I would have thought right off of 95 it would have been a great place. I guess maybe Gold Rock drew the traffic away from it. I don't know. You know, right down the road. Uh, more selection than Gold Rock. they built anything down there, have they? Uh, I, there's a fencing company down there, I think, now. Um, one of the, oh, okay. I think Seegers or one of those fence companies brought that property down there, I think, and they've got something oh, going okay. on down there. Yep. All right, man. Have, have a good one. All right, buddy. Thank you now. Have a good night. Bye. Okay. All right. So let's go back to the Elvis deferment there for a minute, if we could, Brittany. Um, this just kind of tickled me. You know, um, I, somebody within the Elvis camp sent a request in to be deferred from military service, obviously, and um, the the Defense Department says, no, 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 no. If you want, if you want to get a deferment, you got to come ask for it yourself. It says Paramount said it had planned to start Elvis's latest picture January 13th, and cancellation would cost it $350,000 in preparatory investments. Elvis, who is scheduled to be inducted January uh, 20th, says he is willing to enter the Army immediately. He has agreed, however, to go along with Paramount's efforts to obtain a deferment. So. Yeah, uh, Elvis did serve, by the way. He did go in the Army and, and did his, um, I think, a two-year hitch at the time, uh, whatever the requirement was. And so um, I just thought it was funny that uh, they were going to make him come. And I don't know if he ever did have to do it in person or not, but that was what that article was saying, that if you want to defer you've got to come get it in person. All right, so let's go then. I mentioned about earlier about the uh, party line. This, this ad just was neat to me. Um, you know, there was, there was a lot of party lines in use all over the country, certainly throughout the South. They may have been more prevalent in the South than they were in any part of the country. But, um, and a lot of it had to do with the rural, you know, layout of the land here in the southern states. Uh, there was not too many very highly packed, you know, high density population centers. And so it was commonplace for party lines to be utilized. And, you know, you might have uh, three, four, five people on one party line. But um, this ad was an attempt to, you know, kind of be courteous. And, and there's a theme running here. You'll see in these ads there's a theme where CTNT um, was trying, Carolina Telephone Telegraph, of course, was trying to make sure that people were courteous and, and they understood that, you know, if you're on a party line, it wasn't your own line, it wasn't your private line, it wasn't your personal line that you were sharing with others. And so they went to great lengths to make sure that everyone understood that if you were on a party line, uh, you had some degree of responsibility to share that line and to make it available for others, particularly 
um, in the event of an emergency. In fact, there was I, I read a couple of articles today where uh, some states actually enacted laws that said if you know if you uh, are told that you, when you're on the phone that the line is needed for an emergency and you refuse to give up the line, then you can be held liable. And in fact, there was um, a lawsuit brought, and I forgot what state it was in, but um, there was someone on the phone talking and someone else wanted to use the phone and said, hey look, I need to call the fire department, my house is on fire. And I guess the person didn't believe it and they wouldn't release the line, wouldn't give up the phone line, and, and the, house, the other person's house burned down. So anyway, uh, the phone companies around the country went to great lengths to make sure that if you were on a party line and you were having to share your line with other people, that you, you know, would do your part, uh, and make every effort to share the line and make it available for others if the need arose. So let's go back to that last ad that we're just looking at for a minute if we could, uh, Brittany. It says, give others a chance, uh, release the line in emergency, keep calls brief, hang up gently. <laughs> Uh, and you know, that hang up gently thing is something that a lot of folks just never quite got the, the knack of. Um, no tell how many phones have been destroyed over here by somebody slamming the receiver down on the, on the hook. But in any case, uh, Carolina Telephone didn't make an effort. The next one, if you would, Brittany, go ahead and pull that up too. Um, and you'll see here, this guy's obviously been fishing. It says, it's fine to tell how you caught him, but your party line neighbor may be waiting. What he's suggesting it is at times to tell the story um, the long way, but a little friendly consideration for party line neighbors goes a long way. Uh, follow these easy steps to party line harmony. Share the line freely with others. Release the line in an emergency. Answer your telephone promptly and give call parties time to answer. And again, this is another Carolyn telephone ad. And it was just, you know, they were just trying to get people to understand that um, they were kind of all in this together, as old saying goes. So if you had a line and there was someone else down the road from you that needed that line, um, it was just common courtesy to allow that person to use the line. And so, you know, sometimes uh, party lines were a problem, obviously. Um, people would tend to hog the party line and, and use it for... <laughs> uh, calls that really weren't of any importance and just tie them up for hours on end. And so it was understandable folks would get upset, folks would get concerned and, and request that, you know, hey, get off the phone, we've got to use it for something else. Uh, so anyway, uh, I think this next one too, if you would, Brittany, go ahead and put that up. And again, the same theme here. Why certainly, we'll be glad to hang up so you can call the doctor. Giving an emergency call the right of way is a mighty free way to cooperate, uh, to cooperate with your party line neighbors. It's the spirit that makes for friendlier, better service uh, all around. Uh, many of our customers uh, desire different types of service which are not generally available now. Uh, so as individual lines, such as individual line or two-party service, we have a record of all such applications and we're working hard to provide the cables and central office equipment necessary to furnish the service as soon as possible. Um, you know, when telephone service was in its infancy, and the old switchboard operators were unplugging cables to connect one line to another phone and vice versa. You, you know, you've seen the old pictures, old stories, old movies where the switchboard operators switching phone lines from one to the other. Um, you know, a whole lot of that was either manual labor by someone physically doing the switching or there were old mechanical switches that handled that. Um, down on Washington Street, many, many years ago, I had an opportunity to go into the telephone switching office uh, down there and had to do some work in there, in fact. And um, I'll never forget that place was, it was almost alive with switches and, and machines transferring calls and it was a constant clicking, almost like a, a herd of insects had moved into the building. It was click, 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 click. And, um, and so that took the place of the old switchboard operator who had to unplug cables and plug them back in from one line to another. But, um, and of course now everything is solid state electronics, computer control, and, and you don't have any more mechanical switches. Um, it's all done with computers now, so phone calls are transferred and you know everything goes without even any uh, human intervention. It's all done by equipment, electronic equipment. But um, it, it's amazing how far the technology has come in telephone service. And if you think about the things that are done now with telephone lines, I had a telephone employee tell me several years ago that when the telephone systems were put in place, no one, no one envisioned the internet, number one, no one envisioned 
you know, uh, streaming stuff over the telephone lines. No one envisioned the kind of things that we routinely do now. And so it's put a tremendous load on telephone equipment. And, you know, sadly the phone company has been a little bit slow, I think. By their own admission, they've not kept up very well with the growth of technology that utilizes their, their system, their wiring, their cabling, their equipment. And so I think they're probably uh, in a perpetual state of catching up, trying to keep abreast and stay abreast of the technology um, that allows us to do things like stream audio and video and watch movies. Um, you know, several months ago, I finally cut the cord on my cable TV, so to speak, and now I stream everything over the internet. And uh, all our television programming throughout our house comes over the internet. Um, we don't have a cable TV bill. I've got an internet bill, and that's it. Um, that's something that was even an option, you know, five or ten years ago. Uh, and it's amazing now the different types of services you can get that come in over your phone line. Okay, I think there might be one more, is it? Is this the last one, Brittany? Uh, Two more. Okay, well, let's get to the next last one. We'll knock these last two out and call it a night. Um, here you go. This is a real, real neat article here. I won't read the whole thing, but it just kind of goes over what I was saying earlier. One of the first rules in use of party telephone lines is courtesy. To practice good uh, manners on the telephone is to give an insight into one's personal characteristics. Lack of such courtesy can mean trouble, as in the case of a member of telephone party line in Mebane who refused to relinquish the telephone for. That's the story I told you about earlier about the fire department. Um, House burned down because the lady wouldn't give up the phone line. And so, anyway, let's go ahead to the very last one. Here we go. This is anything to do with telephone or telephone line. It was just the, the caption said party line. And these were two dresses. This is from 1951. I just thought these were the neatest dresses here, neatest styles. And uh, these were ads for patterns. So you could buy the pattern and, and make, sew these two dresses from the pattern. And so, anyway... Folks, that's going to do it for us tonight. We've run slam out of time. I want to thank you so much for tuning in and sharing your thoughts and memories with us tonight. Um, I'm not sure about next week. We may have the uh, chief from Rescue Squad on here. Uh, but if not, we'll have something else. So be sure and tune in. Have a great week, folks. Take care of yourselves. Be kind to each other. And we'll see you next week with more Way Back Wednesday. Good night. Watching Way Back Wednesday, sponsored by Davenport Auto Park, the ride of your life. And also sponsored by Flora's Glass, serving the area since 1977 with residential and commercial work.